Hello everyone, today we talk about navigation and nautical science in the low middle ages. So, uh, today we essentially look at the type of ships, the instruments um, and, and techniques of navigation in these uh, last phase of, of the middle ages, actually also not just low but also late middle ages, um, giving a broad look at how the um, how navigation really was about and, and why um, such transformations that eventually brought uh, to the, the European continent to, to expand in the, uh, in the early modern age and obviously uh, even after that increasingly uh, also passed through certain changes into European societies of the time um, and uh, reasons that um, were somehow um, I can't say accidental, but that brought to a uh, renewal of the art of navigation because of other of certain factors that, however, brought to it um, sort of randomly, however, um, obviously always tied to certain uh, social and economical uh, changes at the time. So, um, looking at the ships initially, um, the I think the first thing is uh, is obviously to spend some words about the galley. Mm -hmm. So um, the galley, as you know, was um, the um, basically the the, the standard um, warship mm -hmm. uh, employed uh, since uh, you know the times so of the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, etc., and remained relatively unchanged throughout. Um, time um, during the Middle Ages. I say relatively because, of course, there were um, certain changes attached to it, but the structure of the galley remained substantially the same. And even if uh, during the modern age was a tra the, the, the galleys kept transforming um, in, um, in also in size and certain uh, also. Uh, military capabilities because they began to lodge in the Middle Ages uh, or even before naturally uh, ramps and catapults and they had also to integrate cannons for instance and um, as anti-ship weapons by the way that is not really the same thing uh, same thing of you know just having a I don't know a bombard to um, to launch a bit of <coughs> debris on the enemy uh, decks um, that's something that conceptually goes towards um, uh, an engineering modification of the uh, of of the structure, also in part. Th this is what this was pioneered, telling the truth, mostly in the North Seas. It was the Swedes that, in the 16th century, for for the first time, began to build um, ships that were conceived properly as cannon ships that weren't uh, normal ships adapted to the needs of war. Uh, in fact, just right now, I said the galley was a warship, but as a matter of fact, a every kind of ship out there was a um, in these times was substantially a galley. Yeah, there were maybe other types of um, of ships that were larger already um, <coughs> before the lower Middle Ages that had uh, other purposes, like cargo ships. Especially, I made a video uh, um, about this. Um, if I, if you have the patience, I. I'm gonna find it for you. Uh, it should be in the medieval society playlist, um, which here too many playlists <laughs> I made. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the the title is maritime republics and, and seamanship in the low medi me medieval Mediterranean. So on that video we stick to the Mediterranean. Partly, we, we we talk about Northern Europe also in there a little bit. Today we will talk about it a bit more, but it's kind of um, interesting because it also deals not just with the strictly um, engineering part. It's uh, more you know conceiving how ships were used by the single local um, powers. And today we will partly discuss this um, as well, telling the truth. Um, but um, <coughs> not uh, as a as the uh, base um, uh, as the base topic. So, what about the galley? Well, um, it's a type of ship that is, was propelled mainly by rowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's uh, the galley is this essentially long, um, slender 
Uh, it has a long and slender hull, a shallow draft. D this is quite important. And by the way, galleys, for, because of this, were um, <coughs> rather um, very uh, versatile, differently from other high seas ships that had a um, um, uh, that kind of had a um, uh, uh, a greater. Uh, draft essentially and couldn't go over certain uh, over certain um, um, you know fl say sea bottoms in in the coastal uh, coastal areas because they would have remained struck. This is something, for instance, that the Russians that gave a certain edge on the Russians on the Swedish shores hmm, uh, during the uh, the eighteenth century, because instead of building up. Uh, uh, you know, other mm, uh, ships like the, the tank kind of the Swedes had at the time, they 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 copied essentially the Mediterranean galleys, and they were much more agile uh, around all these Swedish islands and and gulfs, etc. Where <coughs> other, mm, the the larger uh, Swedish ships couldn't couldn't really uh, maneuver, and and by the way, having um, oars is also pretty um, I it's an advantage. Mm -hmm. You just don't have to rely on on uh, uh, on on the sea, uh, on excuse me, on the wind force. But you have also to you you can add to to that. Obviously, that presents disadvantages. We will see it now, but um, it, it's an important edge because you can navigate essentially independently or at least um, autonomously from winds and currents, mm -hmm. and especially you know in and um, uh, naturally was developed uh, <coughs> in this fashion chiefly for the Mediterranean Sea mm -hmm. and uh, we're talking about something extremely ancient the galley as such I think it's um, something that existed since the second millennium BC mm -hmm. conceptually and and up to the 19th century actually you see that it was used um, this is also very fascinating uh, because it was effective mm -hmm. And uh, and this is what makes uh, technology live uh, <laughs> in practice. So um, it's obvious that the zenith of the galley uh, usage and also galley warfare in this sense was the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Figure the Battle of Lepanto, for instance, in 1571. Um, <coughs> it was also one of the largest battles ever fought, naval battles ever fought at, uh, at the time. And uh, there were other, you know... Um, um, the, the galley, however, was still hybrid. Mm -hmm. There were also other uh, ships like the Xebec, for instance, that um, this uh, that had both that was both a sailing and an oaring ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Xebec, for instance, was mostly a uh, trade uh, ship. But whatever. Now we don't have so everything changes naturally. Um, uh, the, the were also present in the Atlantic Ocean as well in, during the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. uh, were used also out there, but the the Atlantic um, <coughs> uh, ships, let's say, designs were s starting since uh, already the ninth century to be something consistently different. And even before, actually, we have evidence that the Atlantic, the communities that lived on, on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in Europe, uh, we're developing other types of, of ships with a much uh, higher and larger hull to withstand the uh, larger waves, um, and etc. But this is, and also partly exploiting more the winds, uh, but this is also maybe we, we, we stop now. <laughs> and um, the so the galley had essentially um, um, the um, had undergone, however, certain transformations uh, throughout uh, its uh, existence, as we were saying before. Um, the the galea proper, as it was called into the Middle Ages, was a bit of a different ship from uh, the tri trireme. I don't know, I don't know whether you say trireme or trireme uh, of the Roman times just to make you understand what we're talking about. Um, they, uh, the Byzantines had been um, for a long time uh, actually on the, uh, on the lead uh, for naval engineering. They had de developed other t 
types of um, different nautical types mm, such as the um, the Calandon and the uh, the Dromon mm. so the the difference here is um, it's a bit foggy to me I think the, the Dromon is the um, was this kind of standard um, galley type was used uh, in the Byzantine Navy between the roughly the fifth and the twelfth centuries AD. Mm -hmm. uh, then basically the Italians um, go past the Byzantines and they uh, advance. It's essentially the twelfth century is the moment into which the West in many things surpasses the, the Byzantine Empire also in terms of techniques and technology etc. And already by the time, by the way, the Byzantines were making extensive use of Italian style galleys that, ho however, were still the, um, emerging from the ancient galley and, and what the, the Byzantine galleys had been about. Um, Constantinople, for centuries during the early Middle Ages, had been the um, essentially the leading um, power, mar maritime power in the Mediterranean, for natural continuity with the um, strategical needs of the of the empire since ancient times um, and it was actually a state so uh, it was uh, a power that could produce many ships mm -hmm. so during the, during the early middle ages the, neither the byzantines were faring so excessively well so resources were preci precious precious sorry and um, and you don't see these huge Byzantine fleets, but the the one that existed was still, however, the, some kind of the best you could find around, both in quality and quantity. Um, the the main Muslim powers began to build up Byzantine and um, I mean ships just like the Byzantines, and for the very simple reason that they occupied the ports of Syria and Palestine and Egypt, where the the Byzantine shipyards and uh, and, and workforce were still there. So actually the Arabs that came from, from the desert um, knew fairly, I'd say nothing about about seamanship and it was these local communities that essentially kept uh, building local galleys uh, like, like they were doing um, since uh, millennia, you can argue. Even in the Latin Germanic West there is evidence of galleys being used by uh, certain powers. Uh, we know that uh, the Ostrogoths used them, the Longobards used them. You know, this is also a little known, but uh, sometimes the Longobards came to conquer certain Byzantine city ports that um, had certain dromons in there and began to man them and to launch raids into places like Sardinia, etc., et in the Tyrrhenian Sea. So that is also quite interesting and overlooked, but um, it's mainly overlooked because it was a small thing. It's not that uh, the Longobards ever developed such, you know, uh, a, f a powerful fleet. But it's uh, it's that made uh, any difference strategically speaking out there, if not in, on on a very local level. So, uh, so the Dromon is um, 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 so the excuse me. I said the Dromon and the. Uh, the Calandion, yes. Um, I, I think I had mispronounced it uh, because I had read the, the plural and I remember it said something new. So the Calandion was, and I had never fully understood what the Calandion, you know, what's the difference between the Calandion and the um, and the Dromon proper. Um, usually the Calandion is, is meant to be a sort of variant of the Dromon. Uh, but sometimes you find this name essentially uh, used interchangeably. This is something that is typical actually of uh, medieval sources and not only because it's true both for the ancient and, and the greatest part of the of the modern age. Um, also, I mean, also in depending on you know in which place you're starting even to the contemporary era that certain um, Names have not really a do not really correspond to a scientific categorization. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, y mm, that such terms were used indifferently sometimes. Maybe they were used just because in one place they, they call it in a way, or or in another, or because there were similar types that were developed that may be different in some s sort. But then the way they evolved, they kind of remained 
uh, roughly the same. So, as far as I've read here, because I don't know much about maritime history, telling the truth, I'm, I'm a sea lobster, even if <laughs> I like to swim, but uh, like any swimmer, I'm, I'm not a great sailor, and, and vice versa, I believe. Um, um, so, um, however, the, um, the, the term clandian appears seemingly from f in during the early 8th century. Um, so it's um, there are many names naturally. Calandion is the Greek name. It comes from Kelles. Actually, it comes from Latin too. Uh, uh, I think because um, Kelles is also in uh, or Chelles, if you want the ecclesiastical pronunciation, it's also present in, in Latin. It means the speedy ones. So it, this was a coarser. Hmm? And um, in, in in back into the lower Middle Ages, you you see the um, uh, this Hellenization of a Latin name to be Latinized in turn, and you find uh, it was rendered like Celandium or uh, Shelandrium, by the way, mm? or Sandandrium, uh, etc. Also, the Arabs had their way of calling it, they call it Shalandi, plural Shalandiyat. Mm? So, th that's also interesting because you have to think that in the Mediterranean, there's always been a sort of um, Frank language that was a mix of all these, chiefly Greek, Arab, and Italian, then in later times also Spanish, but chiefly Italian. I mean, e up to the 19th century, basically, the uh, even the, the navies, the officers of, I don't know, the, the Royal Navy had, uh, were necessarily required to know some Italian, because that was the main language spoken in every port of the Mediterranean, at, still at the time. So you you it's interesting to see from a linguistical point of view all these hybrids. I mean how every local language actually was, um, and and because essentially these um, commu Mediterranean communities um, uh, were extremely involved. I mean trade makes you you know go back and forth from any corner. Uh, the myth that the Mediterranean at a certain point was closed by the Arab invasions is false. Um, you know, uh, indeed, uh, the, the Muslims brought uh, warfare once again into the Mediterranean. They kind of broke the unity of the Mediterranean as a sort of a Roman lake. Um, so this brought to warfare, etc. But warfare was also a pretty uh, solid spin-off for even mm, um, a nautical uh, technology. Uh, wars didn't last forever. Uh, most of the time, these p uh, these um, powers were at peace. And they traded extensively. So even if I think about the ma material culture, uh, all that came into s continental Europe basically passed in terms of um, goods and technologies and knowledge from the Mediterranean. Yeah, okay, partly also through the through Russia and the, um, the Scandinavia, but yeah, the Vikings were important, but definitely the Mediterranean was the biggest thing uh, at the time. So, uh, basically, the Clandion has all the characteristics of the Droman galley, uh, that is, uh, two rows of oars, mm -hmm. um, two Latin sails, mm -hmm. and um, it was steered by two quarter rudders and, uh, at the stern, and uh, it, it could also be equipped at the time, by the way, with certain um catapults but also certain siphons because the byzantines had, in had invented basically this or had invented i mean it was uh, also known in, in the ancient world but there were essentially certain um greek fire um throwers mm -hmm. um they worked with pressure they they basically launched this um inflammable liquid at the enemy uh, at the enemy um ships uh, and and set and and, and light them up essentially, um, even though it wasn't such an extensively used thing because you can use Greek fire only in certain seas when the water is a bit calm, like it was the Bosphorus, for instance, and that's how the, the Byzantines managed to, to fence off certain attacks from the Arabs or the Russians or etc. But for the rest, it wasn't excessively used because in in more open waters um you know if wind changes you 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 get burns as well so it's not you, something you can use by standard although incendiary weapons were pretty standard at the time to to burn the 
um, the enemy ships and sails and, and stuff like that. And um, the the major difference, however, that I managed to stop is that essentially the Calandian was conceived initially as a horse transport, hmm? the, uh, an hippagogon in, in Greek. Um, this is important. Uh, because actually, uh, this is something you find also in other navies. Also, the Vikings, for instance, had certain ships that were appositely conceived for bringing horses, which also, by the way, um, is another stock to the, <laughs> the myth that the Vikings didn't use horses in warfare. Uh, or at least they didn't use it extensively, but it's also false. So, obviously, this had brought initially to a different design of the Calandian, but eventually, as I was saying before, they did. The, it kind of became an, uh, a synonym, when not an interchangeable term, of the Dromon. And it was a Dromon, as a matter of fact, because as, as we were saying before, these were still galleys, so the essentials uh, were the same structurally. Um, so, going on, um, so wh what was the main difference, however, between medieval galleys and one of the ancient world. But, um, let's say that um, the main characteristics was to be essentially a thinner, uh, lower and, f and, and faster ship. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, um, the, as we were saying before, in spite of its triangular um, sail, the galley was essentially propelled by this uh, actually pretty large, uh, impressive number of large oars. Mm -hmm. and, they, they, and every single oar that we see, it, especially later, could be, was usually maneuvered by, by standard medieval times, but one or two oars, but eventually it grew. And um, what is interesting about these orders is also their social background, because many people get this kind of stereotypical picture of the medieval order as a slave, whereas essentially slaves were introduced at the end of medi the Middle Ages properly, these slave galleys, from which the term also galeot came, came in use, at least I think in languages like French and Italian, um, because they, these were, it was a synonym of uh, of criminal. Mm -hmm. But up to the fifteenth century, um, there were still free orders, mm -hmm. and being an order was an extremely profitable thing, especially all these main maritime powers of the um, Italian city republics um, were populated also by these. Um, working force that was well paid and was something uh, well and the stereotype of the order treated as a sort of um, you know of skinny guy that doesn't eat and just just gets whipped by <laughs> by the, the, etc is also a bit kind of a um, false thing of course uh, on the galleys was a very strict discipline but but you don't achieve strict discipline with people who starve Mm. Uh, these orders were very well fed. Mm. You have to think them of sort of like uh, athlete-like people. Mm. These guys had to be very fit. They had to be very strong because the more they were, the more they were reliable and powerful I into the I into uh, especially into battle because um, uh, mm, you know that ramming was something that happened out there and, and, and ramming maybe I will make a video about that but it was something extremely complicated it was something probably one of the if not the most complicated maneuver that has ever been achieved in the, that context I mean it wasn't just about oaring it was a matter of coordination it was really about also um, the marines had to on the decks also to had to shift um, um, along the deck, according to the which uh, side they wanted to make the ship lean, um, and, and, and it was something extremely complicated to carry out. So these sailors, these excuse me, these oarers, uh, together with the rest of the crew, and of course, had to be extremely uh, well trained, mm. and and therefore being an oarer was actually a, profi a profitable business. Mm. Strict discipline, but good pay. They were salaried workers and good food as well. Um, and, and 
and that's when you need orders, especially warfare. Mm-hmm. Not just in, of course, these orders also went into the uh, into the trade expeditions because that was the standard for for, for, for galleys in the first place. But um, in 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 combat, all you need there is extreme coordination, extreme speed, and working like one. Mm-hmm. <coughs> So by the way, also looking at these galleys must have been amazing. Think about all these oars moving together; it's fantastic, and especially s- the s- the pure aesthetics of this very thin, narrow thing that passes on on the water's surface. And they could be very speedy, actually. Um, <coughs> so uh, there are still into uh, I think Mediterranean. If you go, I think into Italy, into Spain, into Possibly also into Greece, there's plenty of um, still of local traditions of uh, think about Venice or um, other, uh, uh, but there are many of these cities that that actually keep uh, making even competitions, you know, with these galleys. That naturally they're not the galleys we're talking about. These are narrower boats, um, the smaller boats actually for racing. But um, for saying how that tradition was actually out there, mm-hmm. you have to think that. At this point, there were certain cities that were making a living exclusively out of, um, let's say, of their maritime business. Think about Venice, as we named before, but there were many other cities that did like that. And there were the best sailors out there in the Mediterranean, renowningly. Um, <coughs> and they had the best, also, war fleets that were used a bit by everyone, by the Byzantines, by the Crusades. Uh, but the Crusaders, sorry, um, and um, so ex- also very precious resources because they were these uh, galleys. It's it's not just about having the galley; mm. it's actually about having it manned by people who are capable. And relatively to this, in fact, I want to um, address you to another uh, video of mine that I made. This is easier to find because it's in the medieval Iberia playlist that. I guess I, I, I see now it's pretty th- pretty meager. I've done only four videos about the Iberian, medieval Iberia. And I can address you to the Castilian fleet in the 13th, 14th centuries. Mm-hmm. Because that's a video in which I, I, I discussed what was the convenience, the convenience, sorry, of even of, of powers like Castile who could afford to build ships actually just to um, hire um other um i mean in that case italian sa- uh, ships and crews and admirals by the way uh think about even the french during the hundred years war uh, they had all genoese uh admirals and and, and sailors etc for making you understand how because th- that video is made is made with the purpose of showing how castile and also other iberian powers began to build their own say national fleets that is important because you don't have to rely on the, on the mercenaries essentially but at the same time uh, throughout all this period um, these ships were relatively few mm, compared to the ones that they are these Iberian powers actually uh, hired from Italy and Italy parti- and the Italian maritime republics for instance per- participa- had participated especially um, on the side of Aragon uh, in to the Reconquista, mm. so uh, kind of sieging from besieging from the sea, the Moorish, um, uh, say the, the Muslim um, uh, strong uh, coastal strongholds, etc. So thinking about how I- even these um, uh, Italian city states had managed to to be all versed towards that direction i mean to 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 work as broad political and social communities into shaping these extremely efficient maritime forces that were needed by also by other powers around mm-hmm. and indeed if you take italy throughout throughout especially the early modern age it had still a huge uh, maritime power if you look at even the uh, all the wars against the Ottomans, etc., uh, Battle of Lepanto, yeah, these were namely Spanish fleets, but basically the, the, the most of it were, were Venetians and Genoese. And all summed up, Italy had this, you know, that with the Italian War, I, the wars of Italy, Italy was um, basically um, 
subjected to the uh, to the Habsburgs, but like half of Italy was under the direct Spanish control. But um, if it's been estimated that if before the Italian wars, Ven- just if Venice and Genoa had brought their naval forces together, it was it would have been impossible to for any ma- power of Europe at the time to set foot into Italy in the first place, um, especially from from Spain. Um, from France, obviously, that was more more of a uh, land power, as traditionally it's always been France, most more than else. Um, but um, of course, the Italians all thought about their own business, mm-hmm. and they um, they eventually lost it uh, altogether b- because of this. And the, the um, however, they still kept providing these huge forces that they had because they, oh, even after the Italian wars they kept being uh, <laughs> ex- <laughs> say excessively wealthy and they could produce such naval power that was uh, at least in the Mediterranean was the main force that would there. Then obviously into Northern Europe also new navies were being born and the Atlantic traffics were growing more growing greater um, we'll see today how, so that eventually Italy remained into the Mediterranean, whereas the other Europeans went more abroad. Uh, it was a kind of a destiny of uh, of the Mediterranean at that point, but not that r- it remained unimportant because uh, the ma- Mediterranean traffic's might have kind of declined with the Atlantic routes, but they it was still a big part of European economy. Um, um so it's a little excursus just to add a bit more to it. So what else can we say? Mm. So let's um give a closer look to this medieval galley. Mm. So essentially the medieval galley was a two decked uh ship. Mm. Um it um it had it was on average, I mean, the, the the sizes could really vary, mm-hmm. but it was roughly forty meters long, very thin. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, the deck could be um, large, as few as four meters, mm-hmm. and also to be four meters high. So it was very low, as we said before, very thin, very narrow, uh, and relatively long at this point, because 40 meters is not a few, and it works very speedy things. Um, so between the 12th and 13th century, the, the orders uh, usually sit on, I mean, we're always talking about standards in here, so it could vary naturally, on 26 uh, benches, mm, uh, with two um, oars, per uh, side. Mm-hmm. So the the oars were something like seven, eight meters long, something about that. Um, and uh, there were various systems into which um, uh, to which using this. Essentially um, there could be uh, it gets down, it's as simple as that. that one could be Basically, one oar for each row, uh, for each uh, oar, sorry. And where later, especially also with when galleys began to, to grow in size as well, especially war galleys, um, the, um, there, was, um, there was another system that basically um, saw more oars at the same oar. Mm-hmm. And normally, they were, they, they were th- this started happening chiefly from the 14th century. And there were usually three orders, uh, but it could reach up to uh, five. So if you make a calculation about this, you realize um, uh, that um, uh, you could have, uh, also in here, uh, considering uh, 24, 29 benches per side as well. Uh, so th- this had increased uh, as well, because the benches now weren't just one bench; they were also now split in two. So, if you you can calculate b- between, especially the 12th and 13th century, that there were even this um, um, increase had not taken place. If you take a 20 se- uh, 26 benches for side, 
um, sorry, uh, the benches were always uh, um, split up, sorry, uh, there was n not a single bench. I mean, historically, yes, it also they could be built like a single bench, but here by bench we mean where the guy actually sits. Mm. So, uh, you can calculate that uh, summing the orders with the crew you can have um, essentially 220 men which uh, 156 were orders mm -hmm. so um, it's freaking it's a lot of people mm -hmm. Especially concentrated on a ship that is not this huge, after all. So, uh, think also about the logistical needs. Um, uh, the galleys, by the way, had to stop frequently because um, they had these guys had to drink, they had to eat. So they they couldn't. It wasn't not a huge space, at least initially. For and and, and this is something naturally you can do in the Mediterranean, where. Uh, say usually the ports are there were many ports. I mean, the the whole coast. Um, if you take the Mediterranean coasts, you realize that uh, they're all populated, more or less. Uh, so it's in a day of oaring, you you always find essentially a place to stop. Uh, you know where, it, 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 and you have to think also the 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 uh, maritime republics in this sense have specialized in a, in a way that uh, contemplated a very elaborated logistical organization, for which they knew that um, because you have to think uh, it was oaring yes, but obviously also sails were used, uh, so it's not that these guys were oaring all the time. Uh, otherwise, if you get them overly exhausted, they're they're gonna work b poorly, um, but if you realize how the currents work in to the Mediterranean, essentially, it's all circles. Mm -hmm. you just imagine the whole Mediterranean covered in circles that all go or in one sense or in the other. So these guys follow the coasts, mm -hmm. um, and they knew I I for every period of the year which current was in that place and exploited it. So they knew that, I don't know, past that point of the coast they had to start oaring and in the other they could go by by sail, um, etc. So the, this also was very important from a strategical point of view because aside from the, um, the various um, ports that were scattered I mean the various um, even smaller things than ports, like it could be a sort of a uh, I don't even know how to say that, just a small mm, bay or harbor with a, some village that could support, I don't know, I think all the political relations that existed also with the local communities, etc. I will have to talk about how, I don't know, the Venetian Empire was built. Uh, that all passes through this. Um, so, first of all, you, you surely didn't risk to, to die of hunger <laughs> or of thirst in the Mediterranean. The, the most important thing from a strategical point of view is that by knowing the currents, you could also know theoretically where to meet an enemy convoy during the, d uh, during the year. It's, it's not before the Victorian age, so extremely late in time, that ships could actually... That, I mean, that, that a fleet can make an effective blockade controlling, I don't know, a strait, a place. Into the Middle Ages, um, even large fleets could, could really pass um, uh, also relatively narrow um, s straits um, without the, the, I mean, the certainty of being actually um, engaged by the enemy. Because the, the the technology could couldn't make it fail, mm. uh, one time or another, um, so blockades were never extremely effective at this point, uh, unless obviously you didn't close a port, etc. Et but let's say on the long run, on a broader strategical scenario, um, it was impossible to stop, um, to to close a a trade of sea. Mm. Um, at least uh, you couldn't make it more or less uh, dangerous to cross mm -hmm. and that's how the whole maritime strategy was based on uh, at this time to, to make a sort of war of attrition of which you had to put in a, into account that a certain percentage of 
the results would have been uh, negative as well. So even think about the risk um, that this entailed and how actually how sophisticated was the naval warfare this time. I still haven't talked a bit deal about naval warfare this time, but something that has always very much fascinated me. So uh, relatively to this last point, um, the um, the galleys were equipped normally with certain marines. Mm -hmm. So the average was having especially uh, at this point of the low middle ages um, something like 30 crossbowmen. Mm -hmm. Later also there were certain men-at-arms as well to 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 launch assaults into the enemy decks and all this stuff, but it, it was chiefly a also a matter of, of a missile fire. And crossbows were quite effective. And it's been said that crossbows have been developed mostly into naval warfare. Um, this is not really true. I mean, there is no doubt that they the, because I studied just this recently in a very updated study. And um, sure. Uh, crossbows were fundamental into naval warfare, but it's not that they've been developed in there. I mean, there is no evidence even of of the relation between. I mean, I mean, crossbows first spread into uh, naval warfare, and then to they went on terrestrial war. No, it's, it's not really said. However, the important is that they, there were, and it would have been terrible to see a battle like between tens of ships at the time. There were also extremely beautiful naval battles, and I've never discussed a naval battle on Schwerpunkt, but I must do it because it, of this time, because they, it's extremely beautiful. And, and w these were extremely serious business um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, of actual, also of, of capitals that were in, 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 in basically invested into this. Because it costed a, a lot to mount up uh, uh, a naval expedition, and, and, and in this sense, all these coastal cities that were, by the way, incidentally, some of the wealthiest in the world at the time had all these uh, components, like all that uh, was meant to, to build the, uh, the sail system, to 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 I don't know how to say to permeate the all these uh, the hull, not to make it. Um, to make enter water and all these uh, also weapons and tools and uh, it, it was all a, all a part of these societies working for it and producing them a huge amount of people these arsenals what they could be about mm -hmm. and in fact you hear in, in the middle ages that there weren't actually permanent uh, naval um, Forces, but this is actually false because the naval forces we we mean it is the typical modernistic t type that is uh, from the modern age we have a fixed um, harbor wi with the ships that uh, bear the flag of this or that kingdom and and that's a permanent fleet. Yeah, but if you took a what I don't know aside from the B the Byzantines that already had this, but if you take the Italian maritime republics, you realize that these guys had all the time tens and tens if not hundreds of ships out there permanently in their ports so I it's true that these weren't actually um, part of the say statal um, navy also because the state was practically made by the families who owned these ships that were the ones who ran the republics but it's as if they had them permanently in there so that at this point there is no difference between a galley and a war galley. So all it took in time of warfare was to, for the state to say re to to reclaim uh, some ships, to to go to war and then to use them. So it's as if they already were there. These were permanent ships with professional crewmen, especially, and th that this is what made the difference, and and um, and also with attached uh, marines that were financed by s by the republic that had to stay there but also by private um, um, uh, private uh, businessmen that they all had um, you can argue that if you went if you ventured into the ma in the medieval mediterranean just like in the medieval baltic or north sea uh, you always had to be armed because piracy was out there uh, regularly mm -hmm or better than piracy, uh, I mean, it's difficult to even to distinguish piracy from normal um, warfare in, at this point, because one thing is, piracy is something that exists mostly when you have a, 
well, yeah, piracy did exist, now when I'm thinking about it, the Saracens, etc. But I, I, what I want to stress, I guess, is that it was normal that that power, I don't know, s assaulted the, the ships of another power. Mm -hmm. And this was also, it was nothing, you know, oh, the pirates appear as if this, these pirates uh, were these terrible, I identifiable things. When you venture uh, out there, I don't know, from, say, from Genoa, from Pisa, you, you already knew whether, I don't know, in Tunisia, the local guys were fine. Yeah, there could be some scattered pirate, but uh, against the Pisan or Genoese fleet, maybe they would have fought it uh, twice before attacking them. Or they simply would have attacked them themselves. Um, and, and there was always someone who was at war with you. <laughs> so you could tell you should Genoa and Pisa hated each other guts. So they were almost always... Um, no, well, sometimes they were allies, sometimes weren't. But what I want to stress in here is that all these relations entailed civilization. Because it implied these Italians went starting into Greece, into North Africa, they read um, medieval, uh, they, they read um, uh, Arab manuscripts, they, they learned Greek, they, they started making accounts to manage all the, uh, the property. I made a video recently about medieval technology to which I talk about the figure of Leonardo uh, Fibonacci, that is quite famous for the Fibonacci sequence and all that uh, rubbish they have made it on with the mysteries of, of my eyes um, and uh, and that's a, pr a good context uh, to th that explains you how medieval technology, medieval civilization passed uh, I mean through which um, what else am I saying, however the title of the video is Scientifical, Scientific Revival of the West 10th, 13th century, a point of medieval technology to which I discussed this as well so this is important. Mm -hmm. The dynamism, the capitals invested, the political and military interests. Uh -huh. People are so obsessed by the Vikings. You have the low medieval Mediterranean folks, study that, it's much cooler, it's much bigger, it's much more dynamic, it's much more brutal, there's much more warfare, there's much more um, skill. It's, uh, there is not just the Vikings in the Middle Ages. Wake up. Um, and so, what else can we say now? Oh yeah, that uh, well, these evolved relatively. We were talking about the Marines, right? We're usually these thirty crossbowmen and other men at arms. Um, the um, so leaving aside, and naturally those expeditions. Think about the Crusades or other. Um, enterprises uh, into which there were entire armies being uh, we're talking even about tens of thousands I think about the, the aborted crusade of Louis IX it was something huge at the time organization of speed. there were people coming from everywhere from England, from Aragon, from France from, it was something huge mm -hmm. too bad it, it failed or it was aborted better um, so even in that case, obviously there were ships that could defend themselves with our troops on board, etc. But this was pretty much the standard to have 30 crossbowmen and some men-at-arms, and this number was increased over time because sh uh, galleys get larger. Um, also, um, in this sense, uh, warfare begins. I mean, there were more galleys, there were bigger, there were more. Um, so warfare increased. The 14th century is a moment, if you look, as you study between Venice and Genoa, there were certain now battles that were like butchery and destruction and uh, something enormous. So, at this point, manpower increased also on the uh, on the um, so naturally there was a commander a uh, then a second in chief, a second in command uh, other, uh, I don't know how you call them, uh, like, um, helpsmen or steersmen, um, um, eight bowmen and, uh, other, um, uh, other 18 various, um, um, crewmen that had to take care of several things from the, uh, 
from from everything. Uh, you, you can imagine all the everything that could go wrong. I mean, chiefly it was the cordage, the rigging that was the most important thing because it was enough. Just it was something also pretty inflammable. Mm -hmm. Uh, ships usually didn't take fire as uh, easily as the, 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 the sails and it, it was enough to take out the sails sometimes to do a very big damage because yeah there are still the oars but while the sails are burning um, you have all to make to the crew all uh, committed to take it out and uh, take them out and uh, throwing them at sea it, there is confusion so that would have been the first target mm -hmm. uh, but yeah sure there were still oars and still the whole galley could go on fire and uh, towards later times now, in the four 14th century, um, you immediately fire, uh, find f firearms on board. So the, uh, the, the, the ballista, that, by the way, they were the, the, you have to imagine also other type of mounted uh, artillery of this, um, in previous to firearms. So since the ancient world, these galleys had things like ballistas um, and, um, and trebuchet. Yeah, there were trebuchet mounted on ships. It was pretty, I can't say pretty standard. It was the, the, the largest ships that could do that, but yeah, it was normal. It was also pretty effective. It allowed to, to not just to smash other ships, but also to besiege cities from the sea. So at this point, also crossbowmen are being substituted with um, gunners, bombardiers. Um, um, and uh, an artillery being mounted on the uh, on the decks at this point, and um, this was were still small artillery, as we were saying before. These weren't were really artillery; they were mounted two feet on the ships proper. I mean, the, the ships were not built. Say better, the ships were not built in order to lodge these guns. These guns were simply placed in there. They were small things. They mostly threw initially. Uh, small projectiles as well and naturally this increases over time um, so the so the galleys especially didn't have many side guns uh, I mean not not very big ones there were certain mm, dedicated um, lodging places that we could be set but the the, the, the board the, the the side wall was about the oars and in fact, what you see is that usually uh, the main cannons were either uh, either on the uh, on the poop or on the um, uh, on, or in, in in the front on the prow, um, so that they could absorb. Also, given this uh, narrow and thin um, structure of the um, uh, of the ship to to absorb along the vo the, vo the whole length of the structure. This these uh, shots mm -hmm. kind of also made it more aggressive because it's as if you could um, ram at the enemy and, and shooting at the same time. Then eventually into the 16th century you have certain circled, circular decks, I don't know if you've ever seen them, there is also the mitraille that kind of um, kicks in, there's a, a, a different type of, 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 of warfare but we will talk about that into Renaissance naval warfare um, for now, we just say that um, firearms developed quite immediately into into ships. Just also t to make you understand how technology works, there is a m there is not a moment into which I don't know land warfare uh, and, and naval warfare didn't progress together at this point. We've seen it with crossbows. It's the same with uh, firearms. Since the 14th century, the most technologically advanced uh, nations of um, uh, at the time, there were Venice and Mamluks. Um, already had explosive um, uh, shells into into their in their cannons, and um, so it was a pretty serious business uh, to be <laughs> on a on a on a warship at the time. Already in the, into the 14th century, it's not that previously was better. Uh, crossbow fire could be something very extremely thick. So, um, as you understand, um, there were there was a need for speed and maneuver uh, maneuverability that um, necessarily implied the uh, had to deal with the disadvantage of a 
very large number of orders mm, that took away space from all the rest. We have seen it that it was, this was a compromise uh, between these uh, needs and the fact that uh, I mean, and the autonomy of the galley. The galley had to stop frequently mm, because it didn't have at this point. Uh, I mean, since every port was relatively close, you could store even a few amount of, of water and of food. Mm. The problem was really water, as you know. Water is um, is especially very heavy, and um, it also had to be. It's complicated to 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 use it, uh, say, <laughs> to 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 access it. So it's um, for the rest. Uh, these crews ate, as we were seeing, a pretty good. Can say can say pretty good diet. I mean, it, it was telling that essentially these guys were well fed in terms of uh, calories compared, to considering what the times were uh, for our age. Um, and the perfect food at this point were biscuits, mm -hmm. because biscuits were um, have a high number of calorie, but they're something um, relatively light, and uh, you can store them easily. So these guys mostly ate that, but uh, there was also else. There was also meat. It depends, obviously, in less quantity, but still. And and these diets were thought also for, I mean, obviously at the time people didn't understand the f physically and chemically the obviously the, the what, what's the nutrition and all, but they they had figured it out by themselves with the means of the time that certain food w was better than other and for for certain duties uh this was true as a matter of fact also for um uh, for for certain i don't know if you think about how knights how the aristocracy ate it was a certain diet that diet that had been formed also considering the physical needs of these fighters uh, sometimes. Uh, then this is complicated. Actually, I promise I will make a video about this because it's not so simple. It's not that the aristocracy only ate in a certain fashion. But I mean, if you were a knight, usually you were you had a particular diet at the time. It was, it was a very serious business, um, not a just brute force, but also dosing your energies and um, and having eating food that was, in the sense, effective in terms of relation of uh, nutrition calorie and what you had to do what you what your physical activity actually was and and that's like today like with sportsmen that uh, you know they they ate only certain things uh, because the organism works um, in a certain uh, you know needs certain things it works in a certain way um so so uh, the, the this easy accessibility into the Mediterranean to ports to warehouses and all had basically shifted all the balance in favor of this kind of more warlike uh, ship, mm -hmm. so that it could host lots of orders. So adding up to the speed and the maneuverability. Um, the problem st start. I mean, things start. This had gone on as we've seen up to the 12th uh, and 13th century in a relatively uh, unidirectional fashion. I mean, even the types of ships weren't that different. But things started to change later, where especially the traffics of these maritime republics began so to be so big that uh, in and especially uh, sea also sea communications grew to be more important than land routes. I made a video about uh, 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 medieval roads and communications in which I discussed that. I mean, um, progressing in in the Crusade a era, uh, you see, for instance, between the the first and the third Crusade. So, in, uh, actually, a n um, not even a uh, not even a century. How a essentially at a bit at, at the beginning, it was normal to take a land route, and by the end of the twelfth century that was considered u useless and everybody went by by ship and that also corresponds to the enormous development that at that time the maritime republics had so at this point you can argue that the, the sea traffics at this point in the Mediterranean especially were enormous uh, they were growing also pretty rapidly into especially into the Baltic Sea into the North Sea um, 
so at this point um the need of uh, it was uh, these guys were presented with the need to embark a much greater number of not just of sailors for because also these ships were getting larger but also more of passengers and especially of goods um so so the galley um at this point begins to to change a little bit and also to differentiate um essentially for mer mercantile usage as well so the oars had in this sense to be necessarily reduced hmm, because the space inside had to be decreased and to introduce a sp especially also a, a wider um sail system so uh, there were other nautical types that were born there were a bit of uh, hybrid hmm? Uh, an hybrid like the uh, great galleys or the uh, galleas um so um th they were called market ships uh, so uh, they were essentially cargo ships so this differentiation brought essentially to the warship and the cargo ship and this implied uh, also a great change into naval warfare um and uh, generally speaking also the organization of society as a whole um i don't know if you have ever heard it but there is the so-called muda system now the muda system is uh, something that was pioneered by the italian maritime republics it was a very um um, s um very important um form of um organization uh, over which the state had a lot of control um, because um, at this point by the way the, the city maritime city republics increased their say startle power especially Venice that was in fact pioneering this Muda system but it was pretty soon uh, you know, you, widespread also in other cities it was those were sort of large convoys with lots of cargo ships that in this sense could store lots of goods and make more money mm -hmm. that were escorted uh, by um, warships so these were sort of naval caravans mm -hmm. you have to think all these ships processing in Indian file and being escorted by the, uh, the ships naturally these increased the need for attacking these convoys so it's not like before that more or less if you wanted to attack a galley yeah this galley was could take goods but it was still sort of an hybrid between a it could still defend itself effectively now there were certain warships and certain cargo ships and the cargo ships were pretty vulnerable mm -hmm. they never got completely uh, disarmed mm -hmm. this never happened but they weren't specialized into combat and there were various mudas um, that uh, that depended on the various areas into which uh, these guys operated so they were real companies in in many ways I mean there was a fixed organization that took into account this larger expeditions that could also be financed by the state to increase in this sense to, to give an extra help to these enterprises and to to make greater profits for the world a republic so there was the mood of Syria the mood of Egypt so th these were by the way the, the greater um, destinations for the Italians because uh, that was uh, Syria was basically was at the end of the Silk Route and Egypt instead uh, got the things from from the ocean uh, from the Indian Ocean route so everything passed from there and, and the Italians had the kind of the monopoly in this especially at this time during the 14th century um, uh, those wars I was talking to you about were fought exactly for controlling those routes and basically uh, Venice makes it to defeat uh, through a better organization Genoa that was trying to to compete still so at this point it wasn't matter that Genoa had the best ships or the best technology it was really having the best state that could organize more uh, thoroughly these expeditions and Genoa didn't make it because it was a more fragmented political system um, this brought the, the basically Venice I mean the, of course the Genoese um, kept 
trading also in Syria and in Egypt. The, the Venice was much more powerful in there. I mean, though this brought the shift of the Genoese towards the Atlantic route, mm -hmm. so developing ports like Seville, um, going straight to London. Um, and they made a lot of money through that as well, and also interacting with the Byzantine Empire. So the Genoa eventually went into the Black Sea and uh, began to establish colonies into Crimea, into uh, today's northern Turkey, while Venice got it straight from the... Um, so from inside Syria and Egypt that were the more profitable routes and this is very complicated actually I, I, I talked to, because there were various streams I mean not all even the same silk route uh, I mean there wasn't just one branch of it uh, it was a branch that also passed through the Black Sea went into Romania um, so uh, every power kind of found the most profitable let's say that, that Venice was able to kick out Genoa from those places uh, she was most bothered by and um, it was uh, the whole thing was won through this uh, also through these forms of organization mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to to tell you which videos they were because I made this is a medieval society playlist by the way because when I talk about trade stuff like that it's always there um there is a big deal of uh, of this i think in the video called european commercial expansion during the thirteenth century so if you want to to search for that it's fine but there was another one yeah evolution of european trade routes in the low middle ages so that i don't spend much m more words about here this thing between genoa and venice but it makes you understand really the broader implications on the and these were things that really changed the world European economy and the, the world European roots this had enormous influences with uh, and implications for for England, France, Germany, Spain, etc. All what was happening between Venice and Genoa. Um, so going on um, So, yeah, so there is not just know that there were huge resources invested into into sea trade at this time, and this had also indirectly certain consequences in the local policies because if these um naturally this was the most profitable thing to do, so also not something you really could decide i mean this cities weren't stupid, they knew where they, they would expand. But just imagine if all those, all that wealth was uh, engaged into instead uh, terrestrial warfare. Mm -hmm. This is a moment, for instance, into which in Italy there is an, um, a decline of uh, infantry warfare. This is kind of interesting because these republics could have invested the same money uh, into land armies, instead they invested into sea armies. Huh? And um, kind of the consequences what you can see in Venice or or in Genoa, I mean in terms of monuments, in terms of also the think about the the urban classes that now were involved in this trade, how educated, how wealthy could be. And Venice was one of the centers of the Renaissance, a uh, great center of culture, of book printing later in etc. But all thanks to this partly. So you can argue that the Renaissance was born even it doesn't sound that right, maybe especially in today's times, but the Renaissance was born through the banks. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest about it. You, we wouldn't have uh, Florence or uh, or Ro or Renaissance Rome if, if we if we hadn't had banks. Mm -hmm. So, and this is actually also in the rest of Europe because, yeah. If you t take the Baltic Sea now, we're, we're gonna go see in the, to the north. Think about the Netherlands, how they developed, especially a bit later in time. But at this time, we're still pretty wealthy and powerful. And think about how they much they contributed to European civilization, thanks to what they could afford with the money they made. So, and it's exactly here that I want to arrive, because. Um, Excuse me, I'm changing one thing here. Things going on on, <laughs> on the internet. 
Um, so what I want to say is between the 13th and 14th century, roughly, there were many important innovations in the field of transports, mm -hmm. as we have seen, and this had been due to the uh, to the increasing um, volume of, of goods that were circulating um, f for the uh, throughout all the European continent. By the way, because uh, we have talked a lot about the Italians, when the Italians were essentially shifting goods. Mm -hmm. So they made a lot of money for that, but these all arrived also into the into the continent, into the north. Um, so um, the whole European economy depended on this, and it was uh, revived by such trades. And um, especially into um, the Baltic seas and or I into, into Flanders, um, there was a big deal of exports mm -hmm. and we're talking both in the field of fishing or also manufactures especially wool, clo uh, wool, uh, wool clothes uh, that is renowned uh, I mean the, the, the Flemish took the wool from just like the Italians by the way from, from England that had say traditionally speaking this this role in, uh, in the European economy of selling wool um and the um so the uh, both the environment and both also these new changes had brought to change a little bit the the type of ships from the galley naturally in the north as we said there were already other types of ships since since the beginning a, a little bit but even conceptually that they weren't excessively different from the galleys and the um, so the galley at this point was not at all a viable model in the north because um, anymore because it it, it it was not fitting not much the trade size but uh, so the new volumes of, of, of goods that had to be carried but rather because of the Atlantic waters. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, you know, with storms and all, the galley was not capable of taking um, uh, taking that, and it was a pretty risky thing to to use in there. So there were other types in in the north of Europe, uh, other types of ships in the north of Europe. Um, from from one side, we have the um, the cog. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the cog was actually uh, first conceived, let's say, into the 10th century, mm -hmm. and it was, however, from the 12th century mostly that it was starting to be used widespread. So also here you see the 12th century. It is this tar turning point to Western history, to which basically the uh, trade keeps uh, at that point, from that point onwards, kind of rocketing. Uh, in terms of of size and activity, and so we are in the full moment of revival of your of Western uh, economy and technology, etc. And it was cogs were um, um, clinker built. Mm -hmm. That means basically you put every um, edges of hull planks overlapping over the other. So it's a bit, bit like the the, the uh, Viking ships, you know. If you have seen the one of how uh, how is it called the um, well the, the the standard Viking longship, you understand what I'm talking about. Um, and they were also built of oak hmm? uh, because this was a ma very good material for 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 that kind of environment, and uh, it was plenty of, of that into especially into the Baltic region. Uh, in Prussia, especially, and this vessel um, was fitted with a single mast and square, a square ridged uh, single sail. Mm -hmm. And um, this was kind of the standard ship of the uh, of organizations like the Anseatic League, that not surprisingly this time was uh, expanding rapidly uh, into into uh, the area, into the North German towns in the uh, into 12th century essentially and it became to dominate essentially the Baltic maritime trade for for three centuries then eventually 
um, the especially the northern monarchies wake up a little. The, you know, the, the Anseatic League kind of benefited from this very decentralized position and weak powers around because the German crown was weak, the Scandinavian crowns were weak. And so these guys over the coasts began to develop a lot. It, it was a bit like in Italy, like like with the Lombard cities. They were far away from major monarchies and they began to become extremely rich in, in, in trade. So the Anseatic League had, by the way, also um, uh, very... Um, uh, it was a bit different, telling the truth, from other um, European uh, trade systems, but let's say that had this huge... Um, development at this time in, in similar ways to, to other to other areas of Europe um, so um, another type was the um, so without getting further detail the other type was the Karak mm -hmm. this was a, a large essentially an evolution of the uh, can I don't know if I can say this pr precisely I, I, I should make a video more dedicated about how these ships were actually built, but uh, the Karak was essentially a, a four-masted ocean going sailing ship mm, that was starting being developed a bit later, uh, especially in the 13th to, to the 15th century, and, and and not just in the north, actually also other Atlantic uh, powers like the Iberian ones began to build up these Karaks, especially in Portugal, that is by uh, <laughs> evident reasons voved to, to, to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, these kind of ships began to, to be built. And, um, however, yes, the, the Karak is an evolution of the Cog. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and, and, and the Karak actually entered also the Mediterranean at this point, so it was pretty widespread also into the... And sometimes it's difficult because there were so... M to, to actually categorize them, as we were saying before, because there were so many variants at this point. And um, the um, the Karak is also this way between the Cog and Galleon eventually. So um, the, uh, the 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 Carvels, for instance, were also derived from the Karak. Um, it, however, the, the main important uh, characteristics is that this was a um, ship conceived for heavy seas and high seas. Mm -hmm. This is also important because nobody had usually gone ventured into the into the ocean. Mm. Um, at the end of this video, we will talk how also what the cartographical conceptions were. So, the the I, the age of exploration begins pretty early in time, in the 14th century, if not in the 13th, depending on how you wanna. And and in fact. Uh, also here, um, uh, these models were built into the Atlantic, although they were still manned often by uh, Mediterranean sailors. Mm -hmm. All the great expeditions of the Iberian crowns were actually um, carried out by, chiefly also in here, Italian or Aragonese. Um, I mean, Aragon being in the Mediterranean, so I, w I was talking about Castilian Portugal, mostly as Atlantic uh, powers. Um, so... Uh, people who also had, because Aragon and Italy at that time were on the lead, also in cartography, in, into, you know, simple nautical practice, etc. So also in here, many different knowledge that came from various parts of Europe and eventually produced uh, the, the, the age of exploration. Mm -hmm. But you can argue that also without the, the investments of the Barian crowns, this these guys could have not made it. So it is true. So it, it's all a coming together. Hmm? Uh, it's, uh, one wor is worthless without the other. Excuse me, I drink a, a little bit again. So these ships were characterized by a great hold. Mm -hmm. And it had multiple reasons for this. First of all, to increase naturally the uh, volume of of the transport, but at the same time also to withstand the uh, the waves, the currents, because um, this was the point. And also, the more these um, you know the 
the heavier the, the, the ship was, the more it was loaded and the more it had enough um, uh, um, inertia, I, I don't know how to say that, physically speaking, uh, um, inertia, yes, that, that um, could make them more stable against the uh, wind, uh, the, the winds and the, and the waves. This was also very important for the development of um, naval artillery because up to that point sh uh, ships had been kind of too weak structurally to even absorb the hits uh, the um let's say the the uh, the how do you say that in english the the recoil of of uh, of of the cannons mm? so you could mount these small can as portable cannons but not uh, making the, the ships absorb these bigger cannons um recoils when this sh because they would have shifted the ship they would have made a so now ships begin to get bigger and this getting them more inertia this meant that they could withstand better also the same recoil of artillery so a big deal of naval uh, development was trig uh, of, of of naval uh, artillery was developed through this um by these nautical factors that uh, you might think oh, I, I never thought about it well yeah th they played a role into this and you see it's not strictly it's not technology that produced the change it's 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 the other way around it's the, ch the change that required it, that, that allowed other technology to have to to be uh, acquired because this was a mainly a an economical reason they wanted to stuck to stuff the ships with all those goods to make more money and incidentally, they discovered that the ship now was heavier, more stable, and could lodge even more powerful cannons. Mm -hmm. And that's how more, more powerful naval artillery was created for that. So it's not technology that changes the thing, but it's the other way around. As most of the times in, in uh, history of economics and in in history of technology. So... Um, one, um, so they also had pretty large uh, sales, but um, say that they were a bit cumbersome. They were not so manageable, maneuverable at this point, because naturally they were bigger. So even the inertia in here played a, a negative role. So you, you see here pro and cons. Uh, technology is always about that. When you um, put one thing, uh, one side, it, you take it away from another, etc. And, and that's what what also produced the differentiation of 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 ship types because now you needed ships that did immediately one thing you've seen it with the muda right with the cargo ships and the uh, warships and, th and this happens in the atlantic as well um however uh, one of the main advantages was also that this sh these ships could also venture a bit more far from land so it was much easier to go uh, into the Atlantic Sea to cross the Gibraltar Strait to to look around and to to venture to open because the idea was at this time finding other markets. So if you take uh, the Canaries Islands or the uh, etc. I mean, this why were they ex uh, discovered now? Because partly because of that. Because surely someone had gone there. We know that in the Canaries there were kind of also white-looking people, and they had to come from where, from somewhere. Humans did take ships and could arrive pretty far. Um, so um, the and what's it, what is interesting is also that there was a sort of a broader community about this. I mean, you don't have to differentiate uh, the Atlantic communities from the Mediterranean communities. At this time, they were operating all together. Uh, if you read Petrarca, I was friend to, I, rem I remember, it was, was a Genoese or an Aragonese uh, sailor that wrote to him what they had found out in the Canary Islands, for instance. So Petrarca was a guy who fared into, who fared, sorry, into, he was Italian, who fared into France, into Germany, into Bohemia. I mean, this, this was all knowledge that was shared already at the time, mm -hmm. so, so quickly and so easily. And they knew all the details. Mm. Um, so now sticking to more technical things and also relatively less, um, also other 
it's about nautical science rather than ship building. Um, these are the same centuries into which the compass enters into use. Hmm? Now the compass, as you know, is something that mm, has been probably imported into Europe from China through the Indians or the Arabs. We, we don't really know to tell it all um, how it came, but however, this is, is being spread now. And why is it being spread? Because these guys found it out? No, once again, it's not about technology now, it's that people needed it more. So, um, the, the, the knowledge that there were these compasses that aligned with, with the north-south axis is kind of, it was unknown by a lot of time before, but it's at this time that that technology finds a degree of application because now sailors need to ori to to you know to orientate more easily um, and the sextant as well the sextant is something extremely ancient mm -hmm. um, but also in here it's at this point that it kind of gets uh, developed once again uh, I mean revive um, I don't know because it's eventually the sex the sextant is something that kept developing throughout the, to the, the world modern age, but um, it's at this point it comes more increasingly more widespread into use. And why? Because these guys had to find out their position uh, without uh, uh, sailing into high seas, so w where they didn't have a, a a coastal point of reference, so they had to use the stars to to figure that out, uh, and uh, and that's why also in here. Not the technology that makes the difference, but people who develop technology for their own needs that they already have and uh, and, and the, the, with the chances, that the, the, the resources that, that are already available. Um, so a, a big deal of development, even though today we will not specifically talk about it and that I love because I made <laughs> an exam uh, uni uh, at university about it, it's cartography history of cartography it was the exam it was fascinating um, cartography also in here was developed for uh, chiefly navigational reasons like if you look at the first maps that were drawn at this time uh, with a more realistic um, um, depiction of, of the world you realize that um, the coasts are very precise start being very precise and similar to you know what you see our satellite or maps, while the terrestrial lands were completely still messed up. Why? Uh, because uh, by land there were other ways to orientate. Mm -hmm. True, on the sea now, having accurate depictions of how really distan distances were was starting to be more important. And uh, you have to think that uh, before this point, because for us that we w we have grown into the age of satellite maps uh, and all this stuff, it's very difficult to conceive that the ancient world, these these worlds in here, lived perfectly well and could travel perfectly well and and carry out p um, political and military activities perfectly well without maps. Hmm? It's something difficult to understand. Um, they did as well because you don't need a satellite map or a precise map uh, from the above to that, that tells you how the world, world is made in order to move yourself. These guys went from from Europe to China on a regular base and they didn't need that, mm -hmm. or at l or at least they were they were interested and they began to to draw this, but they they did that anyway. So you realize that that was not that necessary for them. And the medieval world at this point had um, a very few maps that were barely maps as we conceived them, but because they were sort of just of um, cosmographical schemes, they were some simplification, um, simplifications. Um, the um, that we will see now. So it said the these maritime communities start to um, create very precise um, uh, navigational charts 
that describe everything the coasts uh, the sea bottoms um, all the various localities with realistic distances and uh, let's say they're called Portolani famously and they were very very precise um, up to the end of the 13th century the the, the idea of what the heart w was in in, in those um, people's mind was essentially a globe into which all the the uh, the emerged um, lands were split between Asia, Africa and Europe and they formed a unique um, sort of unique block at the center of which there was the Mediterranean mm -hmm. so like a big lake uh, in some way well yeah, n not really because they knew the Gibraltar Strait, they, they knew there was the ocean around. Mm -hmm. So this was a sort of disk of, of land that was surrounded by, um, like a ring, by the ocean. And it was not thought to be navigable. Even though uh, there were lots of legions that since the ancient world told about these lands, and by the way, uh, inhabited lands that were beyond this ring of ocean. And contrarily wise to what is believed today, medieval people didn't believe the earth was flat. Um, at least this is what was known since ancient times. Um, and it was believed, in fact, that in theory, um, and, er, and therefore also in practice, uh, as, as, as soon as it would have been found, it would be found out that behind the, uh, the Strait of Gibraltar, so the Hercules columns, let's say, and always uh, sailing towards south, um, um, actually going straight uh, uh, towards the west. I'm not sure. That I don't know what now. Um, it, it would have been possible to reach. Oh wait, um, I'm telling. This is what I wanted to say: is that at this time it was not even, not really believed that they could cross into t towards the west to reach the east of Asia. So the idea was that the columns of Hercules. Uh, this was the most pri prevalent thing because now I kind of messed it up because I was saying that these guys already believed they could reach the the east of Asia. Um, um, so we're talking about a very ancient time now. I mean, at the time of Columbus, definitely they thought, okay, the world the, the world is round. So if we go west, we we, we meet the Asia at a certain point. Okay, at this time the the, the the thought was another one. The thought was crossing the Hercules columns, so uh, sailing up to the southeast mm -hmm. and reaching the Indian Ocean. And um, crossing the Indies, uh, getting into the um, to the uh, land of the Great Khan, mm -hmm. that is China, um, where, uh, by the way, at this time the the, um, the Mongols had been thrown out in the in the mid of the 14th century. In Japan, it was called Chipango Chipangu in etc. I think the first time you find this term is in the Marco Polo's uh, the, Il Milio, the, the Million. Mm -hmm. And so because uh, Europeans always knew that there, were, that there was China and Japan out there. Uh, Europeans went as far as China since the ancient times in trade. Uh, even this myth that after the ancient world before and between the ancient world and, and, and the low middle ages people didn't far to China who told that simply because there are no sources who state that of course there were people who fared as far as China we have products that came only from there even into the 8th century what do you think they, who brought them there they flew they flew there there were some bird <laughs> catch coat that and brought it there no of course there were people moving up to China Um, I don't know why people have still these prejudices, but uh, whatever. Um, so, however, uh, at this time, even this route, that is eventually the one that would have been carried out by circumnavigating Africa and getting into the Indian Ocean, was deemed to be dangerous. Huh? 
so dangerous to make it uh, unfeasible, at least uh, impracticable in in economical terms. So during the 13th century, um, so there were several missions, um, uh, say uh, embassies and merchant uh, uh, trips that had reached China by land. Now this is also important because usually China had been reached by by sea, um, also in the ancient world. Uh, also because in the ancient world, the um, I mean, sure, there were people who made it through the land route as well, but there were also certain political, certain political situations that prevented it. For instance, the big deal, you know, why why is that uh, Roman and Persia hated each other gods? Because, and China was worried about the Persians too, because Persia was this thing in the middle of Rome and China, and Rome and China, the, what they wanted was to to trade, and these guys in the middle were stopping them and getting all the revenues. So the Mongol invasion had brought instead to the uh, to the uh, destruction, let's say, of everything that was in the middle. Finally. Then eventually things would have messed up again with the fragmentation of the Mongol Empire. Um, so the Westerners, um, conceiving these achievements, began to say, you know what, um, Let's do it. I mean, by land, we, we can't reach China without excessive problems. Yeah, it's a hell of a journey, but at least the profits can be still high. Because this is what motivated them. Profits. You don't have to think these were these people were pushed by who knows which ideals. They, they wanted to make money. And uh, and that's a perfectly good reason to, <laughs> to be wanting to do something. at your Especially when you do it at your own risk. And, and this, however, also vanished, had vanished, because when uh, the, the Mongol Empire was disgregated during the 14th century, and especially the Ottoman advance in Anatolia um, uh, began, uh, the, once again, Europe and China had remained isolated. So, it, it, or better, they kept trading, but it was much more difficult that um, to, to uh, I mean it, it grew inconvenient to do it by land mm -hmm. so if you wanted to trade with India with Java with Sumatra etc you had to do it once again by sea because by land it was too complicated it was too dangerous uh, because these local powers began to be aggressive once again mm -hmm. while the Mongol Empire had all the reasons in the world to keep trades o trades open now the Ottomans were, in part, absorbing that once again, imposing a problem. So you couldn't trade, you can, they would have not let pass the Christian trade in there. This is also relatively true, because also the Ottomans at times opened and closed these trade routes uh, as long as they needed money, uh, etc. But um, it was something too unstable to plan a broad economical strategy about it, and about these routes. So once again, you had to pass by land, uh, by by sea, and this usually happened through the through Egypt, mm. uh, which, however, this time was declining uh, as well. So even there, eventually, would have been conquered by the Ottomans, and uh, yeah, and that was the main problem now, <laughs> definitely. But by that time, the Europeans had already figured out how to circumnavigate Africa and to go into India by themselves. And then that's why also the Ottomans and the Portuguese fought so much into the Indian Ocean, because they, the Ottomans didn't want the Europeans to open another route uh, in there, at least the Atlantic Europeans, because as long as the Ottomans traded with the Venetians, well, you realize that they had kind of something in